Hello and welcome to another Glyph screencast tutorial for YSDN 3003 Typeface Design. Today's tutorial is going to be on exporting and testing your typeface file. Now, in regards to testing, we'll have talked about this in class, and this is going to be just kind of a demonstration of a how-to. So I won't get into too much of the theory of how do you test your font. That will be included in the lecture. Uh, that will correspond to this video. Um, so remember that it includes things like wanting to be able to export your font so that you can test it in InDesign, so that you can test it in a browser or in some kind of context. And I'm going to cover the two techniques that I'll mainly talk about in class and that is one is testing out your variable font in InDesign so that your instances are showing up and so that you can use it as a static font in that platform. Remember InDesign, as of the recording of this video, does not have an implementation for variable fonts. So that means you can't actually use the axes as dynamic ranges. But that's okay. You can still use your variable font that you've designed as static instances and it'll work just like you use any other typeface in there. You just don't have access to the uh, variation deltas. But that's fine. And then the second thing that we're going to look at today is exporting your typeface as a variable font and then testing it out in an HTML document that I'll provide you or I have provided you in class, which allows you to test the axis behavior of your typeface. So it's simple CSS HTML code implemented in an, in an animation, a CSS animation. And what it does is it basically works a lot like uh, OTVAR player that you've been seeing me use in a lot of these recordings, except I think that it, I find that it runs a little bit smoother and you can test things out uh, within the context of how is this actually operating in the browser. Because remember that matters. Um, not every browser has the same level of variable font support yet. Firefox and Safari are probably the best at this point. Um, other browsers such as Firefox, Opera, I can't guarantee, or I'm not sure if they can guarantee right now that they will be able to actually utilize all of the support for variations, for open type variations, the format that is. So your best bet is to test in Safari or Chrome. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this font that we have uh, right now we're going to export it, but I have to do something to export it. So notice, and this is a good point for us to talk about errors that might show up. So notice how in this font file right now, I've got red uh, tags in the top left corner of every glyph except the lowercase uh, n and also that n that's in the p glyph. Now remember, that was just for the sake of demo. It's not a great idea to sit there and mix these things up. However, um, the reason why you do not see an error message there is because the interpolation is behaving as it should. The reason that you see red tags in these glyphs is because they, first of all, the interpolation is non-existent because glyphs is looking in this bold master for the same points that it saw in the regular master, okay? However, it doesn't see them in the bold master or the ultra bold for our, the sake of our typeface right now. So with that being said, what we have to do is we just have to simply copy these glyphs in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open these glyphs up. And what I did there was I selected all of these glyphs and with the shift key and I hit command T or view new tab. Okay. So let me do that actually from the menu. So select all view new tab. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to have all my glyphs open that I need to work on. And then I'm just going to copy and I'm just going to throw the outlines in. Now notice how it gets rid of the error message. Same thing is going to happen. Also, what I'm doing right now is I'm using command and the number one and two keys to flip between the masters. So uh, number one, command one is the regular master, the thin technically in our file at the moment and uh, command two is the bold. 
So I'm going to just copy, paste these in. Don't worry about the side bearings. I mean, I'll show you a quick way to deal with that, a batch processing way. So just throw it in and okay and I said there's a way to batch process the fitting now technically whatever the the fitting of the N is going to be that's what we should be using for these characters remember I showed you this but for now what we're just going to do is we're just going to throw in a value just so that they're sitting between the side bearings and check them out and it's not updated. And oh, I was in the wrong master. Apologies. I need to be in the bold master. And let's just give them. It doesn't matter really, as long as that they're not negative, because we don't want them crashing into each other. That's fine. So you notice here, these masters are the same. With the N, we have a bold though. That's what we can actually test. Once again, we're just testing this font. Now, I'm going to go into Font Info. There are some important things when you export your font. This is when we're going to actually care about the naming of the font. Now, I've called this font Serif Test. Oh, we can call it anything we want. Let's just call it Serif Serif. Oh, Serif. Serif and Sans. And really, you can only enter characters in the space bar. I don't think you could put an emoji. Let's try it out. I'll see it. I've never tried it actually. And then you could say your name is um, anybody. It doesn't really matter what you put in here. You can put your URL. And of course, we know that these things are operating where we want this to be the default master. That's up to us. And we'll just keep it that way. Now, under masters, we don't really need to worry about anything at this point, but under instances, We've got all of our instances set up, and that's good because we want to see that when I go into InDesign, I need to have the instances set up so that when I open the font in InDesign, it still behaves like a static font. That still matters. I think it matters because we're going to see a lot of people for the next probably five to ten, even longer years, still use static instances because it's hard to expect all users of type who are not just communication designers or experiential designers, web designers, uh, interface to developers. These are not the only people who use fonts. Type, since the early 80s and into the mid 80s, has become widely de uh, democratized. And what that means is that many people are using fonts. A lot of people don't have control really over the fonts they use. When we use a typeface on our cell phone, we don't have too much control. I mean, most of our phones that are running on Android or iOS, you can go into the accessibility settings and you can say, I want the text to look bolder. I want the text to look bigger. I want the letter spacing to be opened up and under that function, but I don't really get to choose things and definitely not the detail of variable fonts. So anyway, I'm going on too much. However, we just need to have this. And what's very important is that the naming works. So in accordance with what the font menu will expect. So the font menu will show a name like this, but it actually cares about this number. So that is the font menu in InDesign, and I should actually launch InDesign while I'm doing this. So the font menu in InDesign or any program looks for this number identifier, and it also looks for the width value too. So if I went to expand it, it would be eight. And notice how the way Variable font axes actually are working on the same kind of number value or numerical system that these are where you're going from number 1 to number 10, 10 to number 9. So a number between 1 and 10. And you're going between 100 and 900. That's sort of the general uh, weight value range. So we can actually see evidence of that in, these, uh, in this table, which would be the font naming table. But see, everything has a unique identifying name in the menu, but more importantly, it has that number, which is actually what matters. This is the name that's going to show up in the menu. And we'll look at some ways to manipulate stuff. Okay, so InDesign is opened up. Cool. Okay, now when you're exporting your font, you have a couple different options. We're going to do an InDesign export first. 
And that the way that we do that is we go File, we go Export, or you can go Command E, and you see a dialog box drop down. Now, if I want to export an open type font, just a plain a static open type font, what I do is I'll select OTF. These other tabs that you see up here, web font, so that would be for exporting a web font. And in class I will explain the difference between what an EOT, WAF2, and a WAF are. And why is why is a true type version than an open type CFF? They are different. And I'll explain what auto hinting is another time. UFO is actually a universal font object. And what it is is it's a file that strips out all the special things that Gliss is doing. And it's basically a working file that is just the raw data. You would still see it if you opened it in Gliss the same way. It just wouldn't have maybe like the bracket layers. It wouldn't get that stuff. See, uh, decompose smart stuff. Metrics are things like the kerning values and the fitting data. Variable fonts, that is what we will be exporting when we export a variable font, but not right now. Okay. Open type font. So what's really important for what we're doing here is that we're going to export our font so that it will open in the application support for Adobe apps in the fonts folder, which means that any Adobe app that you're running will actually recognize this new font that you're putting in there. And when I come back into Glyphs, make a small change or a large change, doesn't matter, and I save it and export it again, it will update more or less in real time. So I'm going to give you a sense of that. So what you need to do is when you see this, you're not going to see this path yet. You're going to go and click on this. And it's going to bring down a dialog. And what you need to do is you need to go to your Mac HD. You need to go to your library. And the wheel spinning. Okay, application support, Adobe. And you need to go to fonts. You could throw it in fonts required or fonts recommended, but that's not the most ideal location. You'll notice here that I have a ton of files in here that I'm working on. Um, I'm testing out different typefaces in here. This is where, this is the kind of feedback cycle that you're going to notice um, that you should be getting into when you're doing typeface design, where you're exporting, testing it out in a document that you put together, Making Maybe you make a printout, or maybe you just look at it on the screen. But if you're working with an InDesign workflow, you probably want to make some printouts to see how it's looking in print. So if I like this location, I say Open. Then I hit Next. And it's going to export now. And I will see either an error message. Oh, it worked. Awesome. We can put a smiley face in a font name in it. Let's see if it shows up in the menu. But you'll see if it works, it'll say export finished. Then what you need to do is go to InDesign and you need to open up a new doc. I'm going to show you some proofing documents. So for instance, this is a proofing doc that I use for my Mazina font that I'm currently developing. And we're going to see what that looks like. This is actually a bunch of just random text, but it's random with a purpose, and we don't need to worry about this. Okay, come on. Oh, it's, it's looking for an old font that I had activated that now is not in the Adobe Fonts recommended folder, or the Fonts folder, but it's there's a ghost of it somewhere sitting around here. I'll have to clean that up later which I can easily do by going type find font and it was Mazina semi bold where is it oh it's there okay that's the wrong one well I'll find it in another, in another time but uh, that was weird okay so now I'm, te I'm developing this Mazina font as a variable font, so I'm testing the axes here. And notice how that's medium, regular, light, extra light, super bold, black. Okay. But these are the test docs, and I give my test docs a date and a time for printing, and I give them just a quick description of what they're for. 
So in this one, I'm actually comparing my font to source serif on purpose because I want it to work in browsers pretty comfortably. And I'm also comparing it to Quadrat in terms of proportions. I'm not copying the designs of these fonts. I'm looking at, this is a good book face, book typeface in text, and I'm looking at what is making it work well and can I get it into the same ballpark? That's what I'm doing in this case of being a font designer. I'm trying to get it to be a good text font. And I can learn the same things that these type designers learn by looking at their typefaces and others. So notice how I'm making a lot of tests. This typeface was originally as Canadian syllabics. And I'm just testing it in different typographic situations. So there's a page, this is a page layout, trying to make it look like a realistic page. These ones are on purpose, not trying to look like a particular page layout, but comparing the whole system here. All right. So that's what you want to develop as a series of documents you can do that with. But let's make a new one quickly. I say quickly, but my computer takes forever to load in design anything. So I thank you for your patience. OK, so let's just make a new file. OK, now what we want to do is we want to make a new text box. And we're just going to look. We're going to type the letters that we have, N, M, uh, I, U, O, H. And remember that we actually had a glyph in P. We're going to look at that. We'll keep it separated. And I'm going to make this bigger. Cool. And let's hit W to get rid of that. OK. So if I go into the font menu, I want to search for serif. Oops. Stay open. Wait. No, we saw it there. Oh, okay. So something didn't show up in the font menu. Ah, it didn't. The uh, colon didn't show up, but the bracket showed up. That's funny. Ah, and it's not working because it didn't like that naming convention. So we're gonna have to re-export the font. That's fine. I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to change the name. Let's let's stop playing around and we'll keep it simple. Serif and Sons and. Actually, I'm just going to keep it even simpler. Serif Sans. Okay, let's re-export it. And once it's once the pathway is set up, all you got to do is hit Command E real quick and hit Enter, and you re-export the font. And what will happen in InDesign is it will update fairly quickly. But we're not actually going to see much other than just a, hopefully a file that will let us open it. Where are you, Serif Sans? Serif Sans, there we go. Now here's something interesting. Because I changed the menu name, it loaded a, a completely different set of fonts. So actually I would have to go into the application support folder and delete these files out of there. And if I did that, I'll show you what the, will happen. It is worth knowing because you might get into a situation. By the way, there's our font. But let's go, let's get a new folder window and uh, we're going to go into the Mac HD. We're going to go to incompatible software. OK. We're going to go into that fonts folder. And let's find those files. It'll be under S. Where are you? Serif and Sans. Yeah, it really didn't like that naming convention. So I'm just going to take all these and I'm going to delete them. And it will update. So that's sort of like a manual way to do it. And it, the menu might not update immediately. It seems like it did update pretty quickly. But let's actually go here and let's go down to the S. Yeah, it got rid of them. Perfect. OK, so let's just select the regular. So we know that. Uh, and because the values that I had in the masters are corresponding to this guy here, this for this uh, letter N, let's make this smaller. It means that my N has got a different weight value right now than this master has. So I could obviously change that. But then again, if I go and I actually flip through the instances, and you can actually see that N over there changing the most dynamically. The N is also shifting as well, but I'm going through my weights and I've got my weights and I've got my ultra bold. 
And what you'll notice is that in the instances that flip kind of thing will be happening, and what was it around regular that it actually flipped to have a cut on the inside? It was after medium, it looks like. The bracket layer, oh, the bracket layer actually kicks in for bold on our static instances. But essentially, there we go, we've got something to work with. Now, but you might be saying, well, okay, so I'm looking at my font in here, and what else can I do? What you can do is you can use this as a testing ground. So I could say, let's do something. Let's say um, I don't like the uh, I don't like the size of the dot on the I. I'm just going to do this as an exaggeration to show you. But I don't like the size of the dot on that I. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it tiny, and I'm going to export the font. And when I go into InDesign. It might take a second to update, and it will only occur in the thin area. We have to select everything. There we go. So let's stay on this master. I mean, another thing, let's say, I don't know, for some reason, I don't like this. Oh, but that's going to break compatibility, and this is perfect because if you do not have compatibility, this is what you see. You do not have, it has no outlines or it's not compatible. Okay, we can't do that, but let's say I wanted to really make something crazy with the same, with compatibility. And I'm flipping back over to, there, it changed before I even got over to InDesign. Uh, so, what you notice is that you can make changes in glyphs, and you can get results to test in real time. So then I can export this again, and it will be the way that we want it to look. That's pretty cool. Now, what is also cool is that I can test text sequences. Now what I want you to do is you'll have seen this website and it's called Adhesion. You'll have seen it in tech in class. Adhesiontext.com is a testing uh, a test a text string tester where I can actually get um, sample text for the exact characters that I have. So it means that I don't have to have every letter in the alphabet drawn. Um, this is taking really long to load. Well, I don't have to have everything in the alphabet drawn. I can just text, test the characters that I have. So I can create actually paragraphs of text, which is very important to testing things out in. Wow, this is really taking a long time. And I can copy and paste it into InDesign. Okay. This is crazy. Wow. Wow. All right, so this is not great. You're going to, I think that we'll fast forward past this part. What is my internet not working? All right, well, while well, this is loading, maybe I can explain something else. Now, what I would do is like what you saw in this document where I would flow in text. Now, in this document, I only have these characters available. I've got a capital R, and I've got an H in there. I've got an E-N-I-P-O-H-L-M-O-A. So I've only got these characters available, so I can only make text strings with them. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying this is Mazina Roman, 9 points over 14. So that's just, well, what you see in the menu there, 9 over 14. This one is 24 over 28. 24 points over 24, 28 letting. Did it? Okay, this is crazy. I never thought I'd say it, but Safari is going to be better, maybe, for this. Or not. I'm just having one of those internet days. And there's today's wiki. Okay. So I only have, so this is what you see when you come to adhesion text. And what I need to do is enter N M I O H 
and I also, what do I have a U? I'm not going to do the P because obviously that's not working in the same kind of thread. So then I select get dummy text. And what it does is it generates a bunch of dummy text with those characters. If I had an A, I could add it there. And then I get something with A, but I could also then take it away and get another generation. And it will keep generating random sequences. So what I do is I copy paste, go back to InDesign, go back to here. I'm going to paste this in and I'm going to make the type a lot smaller. Now we don't have something, we don't have a spacebar character set up properly. Our spacebar character by default is 600 units, but that's way too wide. It should be on average something like 220 units. And now I'm going to do the same thing in the bold master so that it interpolates well. And then I'm going to export the font. And I'm going to go back and it should fix the space character. Yes. And now the N is standing out weird because it's doing that. Oh, no, actually it's fine because it's in the thin master right now. Now the fitting is really open for this font right now, so it's looking pretty, pretty wide. But this is the kind of idea. You get these text sequences and you can also do stuff like you can split up the paragraph if you want to. You can do a paragraph with an indent. You can actually start using the type in context as type. That's very critical, I think. When we're designing a typeface, we need to know how it works. We need to say, what does the font look like when it's under letting conditions like this, wider and open? Or what does it look like if it's set very tight? You get to control the space that you design within, the design space that you're working in, as opposed to the variable font design space, but I'm not going to confuse you with that. Okay. Let's go back here and now let's export a variable font. So with a variable font, I'm going to keep using Safari for now, but you can open up these websites in Chrome. Okay. Access Praxis. Now Access Praxis is a site that allows you to actually drag and drop your font in and test its variable functionality like this. So notice how I can go, this is weird, Zeitung should work. Ah, there it is. So if I've got Zeitung, which is an underwear typeface, I can actually drag, oh, what's going on? I can drag the sliders. What might be something that you recognize as San Francisco from Apple. They've got theirs as a weight variable. Not too crazy. There's some crazy ones on here, though. Um, well, actually, you know what? Remember ProTipo. ProTipo variable. Remember... Oh, maybe they took it offline. Yeah, it looks like they don't have it. But anyways, we'll drag our font on here. We're going to go to variable fonts, and we're going to drag it, and we're going to just put it on the desktop. Actually, you know what? Let's not do that. Essentially what you want to do with this with this variable font is you want to throw it. You could just export it to the desktop, but you want to take it. I'm going to go into the folder for this course, and I'm going to go to when I yes, have this. And what we're going to do is we're going to export our font into the same folder that I'm calling variable font animation test. You will have this folder that has this HTML file, and that's the one that we're going to actually use to uh, edit your font. So we're going to look at how to use that now. So let's throw our font in here. So it's going to export directly in there. And as long as we have compatibility, the variable font will have exported. So we're going to go find that. And there it is. Serif Sans GX. Okay. Now let's open up this in any code editor. It doesn't matter. You could use, uh, I use BB Edit. You could use Atom. You could use brackets even. Uh, but it's not as quick, I would say, to do this. We don't need something like brackets. I know that a, there's a program that a lot of you guys are using now. I can't remember what it's called, but any text editor works. And great. So now here is where I will actually enter the characters I want to see. So right now I just want to see the N. And let's look at the P as well. 
I can enter any character down here and I can enter actual words. But I'm not going to do that for now. And it's a really simple HTML doc. You'll see what it looks like. And right now, we need to look at a couple key things. So I need to say what the font name is. So, whoops. Sorry. That. Nope. Where did that go? Okay. I need to change. I can keep the font name, whatever it is. This was just for that Penny Sans font that you saw. But I could just say test. Uh, variable font test. And then I can take this down and say the same thing. Because this is, so this is where the body is reading the kind of CSS instructions here. But what is important is that the source URL is this file name. It has to be this exact file extension. So I do that. Now that's going to be active. However, it's not going to work because our variable font does not have a width parameter. This is the width tag. We have a weight parameter. So w, w G H T. And our font doesn't go from 0 to 1,000. It goes from 100 to 900, I believe. 200 to 900. So that's what I'm going to enter in here. And basically what this is, is this is a CSS animation. And you can control the animation speed here, the size. I'm going to make it a bit smaller for now. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to drag it into any browser. Okay. I don't know why I had to open up a new one. Ah, you're taking so long. I apologize for my computer's tardiness today. Uh, okay, let me just throw this into Safari, because apparently Safari is having a better day than Chrome on my computer. Okay, and it's playing. Awesome, let's make that bit bigger. Now what you can do is you can edit this animation in real time. All you have to do is make a change to your code, save the file, and then refresh your browser window. And you can test things in here. And it's playing, you can see that flip there. You can see it's playing a continuum of the axis, and there's some weird stuff we see here, but for the most part, what we're doing now is we're testing the font in context, which is really important. So right now I'm having a look at how things are behaving. We can see how this is doing its flip thing. We can see how this continuum is going. And I can slow it down if I want to get a better look at it. I can, or, or, actually this would speed it up. This will make it play really fast, quite fast which is fine. So what I care about here is I care about checking does the design space feel comfortable? Are there any weird kinks along the continuum? Do I see weird stuff that I need to have this bracket trick on to make a switch for? That kind of stuff is very useful. Now the other thing is I could also drag my font into Axis Praxis and test it in here. That's also an option. So remember we only have certain characters no. Where's our font? There it is. We don't have a Q, but we have an N. And we can make it larger, give it more space, and we can test it in here, and it works on a slider bar system. We can also use this, and we can see, ah, oh, the flip's working. Nice. And it can go all the way to bold. So this is another great way for you to test it in the browser. I think that the animation is a really great way as well. Another thing you can do is grab the dummy text and you can throw it into this, but what you would have to do is suspend the animation so that it does not run. Oh, I don't want to turn off that. Comment that out for now. And then what I can do is I can throw the text in here. It's going to look a little weird. And then I'm going to open this back up again in Safari for now, because it seems to be working better today. And the font is massive. I, I forgot to change it, actually. Let's change it to something more real, like 16M or something like that. Or sorry, not 16M, like 1M. How about that? That's more like a realistic size. Oh. 
apply. Probably this is why. Well, that is, ah, okay, I know why this is not working, because we don't have the glyphs drawn. But if you did throw this in here, uh, this font in here, for instance, do I have a full font? I'm going to show you one of my fonts. I'm going to show you Mazina and show you how this works, and then I'm going to wrap this video up. But I want you to know that it works. Okay, so fonts, uh, proofs. Mazina browser proofs. Is this the one that, this is not the one. This is the one. Uh, there we go. So really I can test it out in here. I can control the line height and everything. So if I open up this file, oh, it's, my apologies. I thought it would open in BB Edit. There we go. And now I've got my Mazina font in here. It's at 2.6 M, so I could go down and make it more of a realistic size for a browser. And then I can, oh, I guess I'll go back here, refresh. That's actually not a great point size for a browser. I think this is better. Okay, and then you can test it in here. The reason why it might look a little fuzzy to you is because I am on a non-retina screen. Okay. That's a lot. That's a big video, so feel free to fast forward throughout this. It's, it got a lot longer than I expected. However, it tells you everything that you need to know in terms of testing your font, in terms of platforms for that. Please ask me any questions if you have any.